Excellent. Uh, you know, I have, um, I have a great difficulty to be in an audience if it's one or 10,000 people, doesn't make a difference, but I have to be able to look people in the eye. If I can't look people in the eye, then I can't give a lecture, then I can't get into a dialogue. So to me, this is number one, and if I have the chance to know a little bit more about who's in the audience, I prefer. Um, because that allows me to adjust my presentation uh, to the interests and the backgrounds of all of you. So basically, my, my reflection is always starting from nature. So sitting in a room like this to me is always very painful. Air-conditioned atmospheres, off-gassing from chemicals from the furniture, um, accumulation of uh, mites into the carpets. Uh, you know, it's, it's the most unhealthy atmosphere we could be in. So I'm, I'm glad you limited to a couple hours because I can't survive in this environment. Um, uh, unfortunately, we always organize lectures in places where life is not viable. Um, you can speak, but you cannot live in these environments. I, I prefer the, the forests. I prefer the forest where we can really start thinking about the real forces of life. And it's very interesting that when I ask people uh, what is the most abundant force that is available in this forest. Uh, people think it's, it's the sun. It is not. The sun is not the greatest force in this forest. The, the, the sun is actually, the, the trees have protected the whole range of life to be protected from the sun because the sun has ultraviolet and ultraviolet kills everything. It sanitizes it all. I mean, we even use it to kill bacteria and then when you have a blunt exposure to the sun and the energy of the sun, then actually you are not promoting life. Life is promoted in this forest by gravity. The force of gravity generates electricity in the soil. And if you don't have gravity, that's why if you don't have farms with trees, then you can't have the right electricity in your soil. Your soil will never be activated unless you have trees around. Trees are critical because the piezoelectric pressure, the pressure from the tree, the weight from the tree, will continuously generate minute amounts of millivolts, which is what exactly life requires. And, and we've forgotten that. That's why agroforestry is so important. I mean, that's why we can't just cut down all the trees and make land to farm. That's why it's not enough to be organic. That's why we have to have farming systems that bring the natural forces of nature back into the play. And it's not about chemistry, it is in the first place about physics. Farming is physics. If we don't understand the physics of the forests, if we don't understand the physics, then we do not know how life has evolved on Earth. And so I come from observations which uh, typically the agronomist, uh, the biologist, uh, the chemist, uh, they will not make that because um, my mind is very pragmatic. I want to transform society. We have a society that is incapable of responding to the needs of all life. I mean we're only worried sometimes with, a, I mean it's amazing the sustainable development goals only worry about people's life. I mean, what about the other 100 million species with whom we share this planet, or billion or 10 million, we don't know even. We don't even know how many different types of species are on Earth. We don't even know in 95% of the cases what is a male and a female mushroom. I mean, let me submit to you that if you don't know what is male and female, what do you know? And of course the only option you can see then in order to solve the problems of food is genetics because you haven't worried about discovering the basics of life, male and female, procreation. And I think this is part of the challenge we have and therefore um, all throughout my life I've been very much focusing on, on practical things. How do we get things done? I don't care if there is 99% of the scientists who say this is wrong. If I find a few of the scientists who say this is really transformative, this is a chance, then I'm going. But my organization only 
participates, starts, supports, backs, uh, listens, uh, dialogues with projects that have never been done before. If it has been done before, do it again. If it hasn't been done, we're interested. And I think this is a spirit of, of innovation because that is what evolution is all about. Every single species in nature is always looking for finding its niche, finding its due life conditions, and within that continuously innovate, continuously change, continuously adapt, and continuously be symbiotic. Life is not only evolution, life is symbiosis. And I think this is very important that uh, our educational systems have uh, unfortunately split everything that we know into very narrow areas where we become more and more experts until we know everything but nothing. And I think this is uh, the great challenge. So my organization um, today has implemented more than 200 projects, but 200 project means initiatives that change the rules of the game. And we have done 5,000 mushroom farming projects around the world and that's for us only one project. Because that's generating food from agricultural waste like coffee and turn that into a produce. So we're very much focused but to me it is impossible to, to start any lecture about anything, to share any information without sharing you the faces of the people who have inspired me. Um, you know, we always stand on the shoulders of other people and these are the people who are happy to carry us. And uh, the key person in here is the one in the center, that is Aurelio Pecei, he was the founder of the Club of Rome um, and that is the person who really opened my mind on how we can be executive of a corporation, how we can be entrepreneurs in business, and at the same time, how we can be committed to the common good. How can we succeed? I can spend just a day by going through every single picture that you have on there. Um, and, and of course, uh, we need to be able to recognize um, those extraordinary people and I've been very fortunate to learn to know people from all around the world. I am a product of all these people. I'm not just the, the son of my parents, I'm, I'm the product of everyone on there and many others that I cannot mention in here. Um, I've been able to write. Um, the great luxury in life is when you can take time to write. Um, some people say I'm addicted to writing. Um, I don't think there's any day that I'm not spending time to write. Um, some people meditate, I write. Some people do Tai Chi, I write. Uh, some people do yoga, I write. And because writing is a dialogue. Uh, writing is dialoguing and actually I do not know where the first has come for but when time is right I sit down and I just write and it flows. I can write 20, 30, 40 pages in one day and I hardly need to edit it. It's like Mozart composing music. It just comes. You know, when we look at Mozart's life and anyone would like to copy everything that Mozart has ever written, it'll take the life of Mozart to recopy what he has composed. And um, uh, somewhere someone decided that I was going to be writing. Um, one of my books is The Blue Economy. Um, the title was decided by my wife, Katerina. She said it's going to be The Blue Economy. Um, and uh, it's basically was a compilation of more than a hundred ideas that I felt time had come to implement. And every single idea is inspired by nature. My master is nature. It's the real master. I mean, come on, after four billion years of evolution, who else pretends to be the master? I mean, of practicalities on the ground. I mean, uh, anyone else who has, uh, who dares to prevent, uh, to pretend um, that's a show of arrogance and egotism, 
because the only master we have with that level of experience and sense for promoting life is, is nature. Over the years, I've been very fortunate, for example, to be able to create a network of scientists. I'm not a scientist. I know nothing about science. Uh, I love science, but I don't know science. But I like to listen to the scientists. And in 1994, I had the great privilege to be invited to, by the United Nations University in Tokyo with the support of the Japanese government to set up this think tank on what if the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 will be a reality? How would business look like? How were we going to do business when we achieve zero emissions, zero waste? And of course, the immediate reaction from our American and European friends was zero is impossible. Didn't you learn the physics? I mean, the second law of thermodynamics is clear that zero is impossible. Well, we don't care if it's impossible. We want it to be absolutely crystal clear that we're in need of a transformation. We're in need of a new way of looking at reality. And that implies that the least we can do is have no impact. The reason why we said zero emissions was that we cannot do less bad we cannot reduce our emissions. We cannot have impact anymore the way we're having it. So it was a very blunt statement that zero is the minimum, not the goal. It's the minimum is zero impact. What we should do is restore, regenerate life as it was on Earth and put nature back on its evolutionary path because we have taken nature off its evolutionary path. We have broken the symbiosis that has been dominating the, the creation of life and the conditions for life for everyone. And therefore, my view was that zero is the minimum and regeneration is the goal. And of course, coming from an economist, uh, people declare that uh, as absolute nonsense. And as an economist, I have the right to sell absolute nonsense because that's what economists do all the time. Um, economists are known to explain after the facts what happened. They can never predict anything what will happen. But in management theory, there is a very interesting concept that is called zero. I mean, when you want to have health and safety, you go for zero accidents. You can't say that you will tolerate 10 accidents a year and statistically 10 people dying in your factories is fine. You can't say that. You have to have zero accidents. If you are a quality control manager, then you can't say that you accept that 15 of your cars will actually break down and burn up in fire and that's fine statistically because zero is not possible. I mean, you can't say zero is not possible. You have to say it's total quality you have to say it is zero defects. And that is why I was able to create the bridge between what we thought was necessary as a concept of zero emissions for our management and our right to live on this earth and the management principles that are dominating. Now, also in social sciences, if I hear um, the interest in the social sciences, in the social sciences, you know, we have a very simple parallel. If I'm a thief and I'm stealing, and I'm standing before the judge, and I'm telling the judge, I will steal less, the judge will not be impressed with me. Actually, I will go to jail. If I'm promising that I will not steal all week, but only steal in the weekends, it is obvious that this is nonsense. So, I don't care about the second law of thermodynamics. I care about the reality in life. And stealing is stealing, and stealing less is still stealing. And that's not good for society. And polluting is polluting, and polluting less is still polluting. So don't tell me that zero pollution is not possible. On the contrary, it is the basis of our logic. That doesn't mean that you don't have any excesses. That doesn't mean that you have no waste. But it means that you're not wasting your waste. You know, the only species living on Earth 
capable of making something no one desires is the human species. I mean, we're so smart, we can make waste no one wants. I mean, this is quite an amazing achievement. It's probably the only cultural achievement of significance. It's not about brain and vision and creativity and, 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 and our handling and our toys and our... No, 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 no. We are the only species on Earth that makes waste that no one desires. And, and I think this is how we have differentiated ourselves. So surrounding myself and having access and dialogue with thousands of scientists over these past 25 years has permitted me to mine the best of science, to get the greatest ideas. And today I have a wonderful situation because every day I receive dozens of proposals from scientists who tell me that they have found the pathway to save the Earth. This innovation will change life on Earth. Well, then I'm listening. And I'm asking the same scientists to judge the scientists who made the proposals. And you know, scientists are very hard with each other. They tear each other apart. Scientists criticize. They just undermine any hypothesis that anyone has made. And as a result, once a month, I have a proposal where my scientists agree this is most likely a revolution. And when I know that this is the revolution that they've proposed to me, then I'm going to see the person who invented it. I want to see them. Because I don't want to work with people who want to be a unicorn, who want to just make money. I want to know people who want to be engaged with the common good. And if I find a person has an extraordinary innovation and is ready to commit to the common good, we can work together. If they're not committed to the common good, it's a waste of time. So then I need, I need badly, the entrepreneurs. I myself have a very entrepreneurial background and I think the beauty of the entrepreneur is that he never needs the science. The entrepreneur doesn't need the market study. The entrepreneur needs the belief that it's possible. He sees an opportunity. She sees the chance. And when she sees the chance and goes for it, then there will be a transformation of reality. I mean, there is no market study that ever demonstrated that the iPhone was going to be a transformation communication tool. No, but Steve Jobs knew, but no one else in the world had proof. This is what we need. We need people who are ready to do things not because there is proof that it will succeed, it's because they believe. And we have eliminated the concept of belief, believing in yourself, believing in others, believing in transformation, believing in the capacity of society to do better than ever before. And since we have lost the belief and we want everything to be sub sub substantiated with dozens or hundreds and even thousands of footnotes, we have lost our capacity to go for implementation. And that's why we have this uh, great obsession for the need to work with entrepreneurs who don't care what the science says, who don't care what the market and analysis uh, says, who don't care how consumer behavior is evolving. They're just going to do it because they think it's the time to do it. And, and there I'm, I'm, I, I have seen now the past 25 years what kind of a transformation is possible. And in the end of the day, there's nothing less than transformation. But transformation, you do how? Transformation is because you add value. I mean, if you're not doing better, much better than before, why would people change? I mean, if you're not able to produce 10 times more food, a thousand times more food, why would people ever go for your option? So it is not just the value added in terms of money, it's the value added also in terms of health, value added in terms of cultural uh, flourishing. It's a value added in terms of your resilience in your community, in your society. What is the value added? And you have to have not one additional value. You have to have multiple. And this is something, again, we learn from nature. Nothing in nature is done for one reason only. Nature always does one thing for many good reasons. I mean, a leaf on a tree is not only there to catch the sun. 
with chlorophyll transformed into energy. That is just one of the tiny objectives of a leaf. A leaf is also there because when it's wind, it's pumping. You know, and if it can't sit in the wind, hang in the wind and pump, then of course the capillaries will never be able to go against the law of gravity. So why would we reduce a leaf to photosynthesis only? I mean, that would be a very stupid thing to do. And the leaves, of course, are there to diffuse ultraviolet and protect the soil from the onslaught of the ultraviolet and so on. So what we have as one of the worst results of Western culture is that we reduce everything to one thing. And as long as we reduce everything to one thing, we can never be sustainable and we can never add value. This requires innovation. This does not require innovation in technologies. Innovations in technologies are around all the time. It requires an innovation on how we run business and how we run society. That's where the innovation needs to come from. We need to do things fundamentally different. And if we're not ready to innovate, but what kind of innovations? I only have one type of innovations, disruptive ones. The ones that are a nuisance to everyone. I very often have to apologize and say that I will disturb people. I will make people uncomfortable. Because comfort is not what we need. The continuation of the comfort is the destruction of our culture and society. And that's why I don't like air-conditioned atmospheres. You know, if you really want to do a good video about my work, we should be outside in the forest. We should be sitting on soil, not on chairs. Because that is where real life is. And that's where we need to look at. So disruptive is our parameter. Minimum disruptive. Minimum. If it's not disruptive, don't do it. Don't even think about it. And so that is why over the years I have, um, uh, I have gotten this uh, very clear understanding that if Gunter is involved, it will be disruptive. It can be fun. It can be surprising. It can be different, but it's definitely disruptive. And disruptive doesn't have to be bad. Disruptive is only bad for the ones who want to continue doing what they've been doing before. For them, it's very bad, because they just like to live on autopilot. I mean, it's quite amazing how society wants everything to be self-driving, autopilot, artificial intelligence. We don't have to do anything anymore, just play video games. I mean, we just have to watch Messi scoring on a goal or Ronaldo making another goal. And we just have to wait till another five people put a like on my Facebook. I mean, that's the kind of uh, air-conditioned atmospheres we have put ourselves into. And that is why I believe the only way to get out of it is to continuously surprise people. And, they, and, and it's part of our core culture. I mean, let's just think about Christmas presents and about the New Year and about our birthday presents. We love surprises. Surprises is part of our innate desire as a human being to be surprised. But of course you want to be happily surprised. And the happiness doesn't have to be happy for you, but happy because we're doing much better than we ever thought possible. And so that is why I show this picture of the incredible forest of Patagonia. Patagonia in Latin America which is this uh, unique space where, thanks to the collision of the tectonic plates, the Andes Mountains uh, moved up. And thanks to the moving up of the Andes Mountains to four, five, six thousand meters, the Amazon, which was flowing to the Pacific, had to find an exit in the Atlantic and submerged 40% of the whole continent for two, three months a year. And while life was adjusting to this excess of water, new life emerged. But then we have to understand if this crisis situation is uh, unfolding, what life is most resilient? Of course, the smallest. The uni, the single cells are the ones who will secure that everything gets reorganized. And so when I'm asking the question, if you see this picture, what is the greatest biodiversity in this forest? People are thinking about birds. They're thinking about plushy animals. They're thinking about maybe worms. But no one realizes that the greatest biodiversity here is yeast. 
yeast, thousand different types of yeast in this forest. Now, have you ever been on a yeast safari? Have you ever gone out catching yeast? And no, 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 we catch butterflies. We go and watch birds. But catching yeast, yeast safaris, we don't do. But I don't understand. The basis of culture of society is based on the domestication of yeast. That's how we started. I mean, it is not uh, farming. No, no, no. First, yeast. We understood that with yeast we can make bread, that we can make kimchi, that we can make tofu, that we can make beer, that we can make wine. I mean, yeast is the basis in every home, in every food that is served in every home. There will always be yeast. Always. And if you didn't put it in, it's in the air anyway. So, why if we're rethinking life on Earth, you've got to start with the smallest. And the most economical, the most, the one that has the greatest impact on economic life has been yeast. The one that has the greatest impact on health has been yeast. Because if you don't put it through fermentation, it's going to turn bad. It's the first great preservation agent. Afterwards we found out about salt and we found out about, about sugar and we found out about uh, tea tree oil and we found out about many other things but the start was yeast and therefore we have to go back to the origins and I'm, and I'm very happy to see that even large corporations like Heineken are now brewing beer with wild yeast. I mean, you cannot do it. The beer is totally different when you have a genetically modified uh, yeast versus a wild yeast. And wild yeast gives you as predictable results as you have a genetically modified one. It's as predictable. I mean, it's not about predictability. Taste is great, but it's very varied. And I think, for me, this is very important. When we look at a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, we know that bread is a product of culture. And bread is not possible without yeast. Unless you go for Arabic bread. Uh, you know, uh, there, there, there are some exceptions, but what I think is very important is the expression of the diversity of bread, starting from the sourdough. I mean, sourdough bread is the longest living generation of cultured food in the world. I mean, a sourdough that you eat today in Germany is coming from the same mother culture of a thousand years ago. And it's been handed down and handed down and handed down. And we don't celebrate that. I mean, we're so stupid that we go to the shop and buy a new sachet of uh, yeast for every time we make our own bread. If you make your own bread, and then you're already a great exception. But the sourdough, you always need to take a piece from the old bread in order to make the new bread. And, and we don't do that. That's the same with yogurt. We used to just get one culture of yogurt, and for generations we used to use the same. And now, because we like plastics, we do it in plastics and we throw it away and we have a new culture all the time. And the culture of the yogurt that we have today is genetically modified, has nothing to see with the cultures that were there originally. And so, what have we done? Whereas, I was checking the forest today. In that forest, I can guarantee you, we can find 20, 30 different yeast, wild yeasts, to make your own beer bread and to make your own food. It's right there in the forest, particularly when it's kind of moist and damp, like this morning. Um, they're the right yeasts. They will be the white yeast. In the summertime, you have the green ones, which are not so good. One of the main characteristics of our work is we want to be positive. I mean, I'm sick and tired of all the bad news. If you want bad news, there is bad news. If you want very bad news, there's a lot of very bad news. You want to submerge yourself in the statistics with bad news? It is a lot of statistics that show you the world is going all the way down the drain. I don't care. I don't care about statistics. Because what is statistics? If I take this hand and I put it in ice cold water, and I take this hand and I put it in boiling hot water, on average, my two hands are fine. It's ridiculous. My hands are not fine. Both are hurting. But on average, it's fine. And I think this is part of the challenge that we're facing. We're submerging ourselves with statistics that only gives us averages. And of course, we have taught so much statistics at so many universities where we always have to do the same stupid Gauss curve. 
We always have to do the same variation analyses. Forget it. Change occurs from minute shifts, dissipative structures, Ilya Prigozhin, the Nobel laureate chemistry, he taught us that minute changes, we call it the butterfly effect. And we know the butterfly effect is a reality. It's only when you're in simple mathematics, linear mathematics, you can get this. But the reality of the world and the reality of nature is that nothing is linear. Everything is non-linear. The only linear mind that exists in the world is our mind. So as long as we're in a linear mind, we're going to look for averages and we're going to cheat ourselves. We're putting ourselves in worlds that don't exist because the world of averages. And then you say, so much percent this and so much percent that. Sorry, that is not how we design, imagine, dream about a new world. A new world needs to be the capacity to imagine the positive, the good, to focus on it and do it. And from there on, just like a yeast can go on for a thousand years with the same little yeast you picked up from the forest, that same yeast can give you life for a thousand years. Well, that's the kind of changes we need. Small things, but oh my God, if we pull it through a thousand years, it's a complete transformation. And that's why when you look at this picture of this Norwegian boat, I mean, this is Norway, right? This is the richest country in the world that still isn't able to get a handle on its uh, emissions from its cruise ships where they pack 5,000 people in a boat so they can generate 10,000 of tons of waste. You know, on a packet boat, 50% of the food is not served to people. 50% of the food is to look beautiful on the buffet and is thrown away. And of course, they claim that they've gotten very smart because now afterwards the food is shredded and give us fish feed. But have they ever asked the fish if they like to have pineapple? Have they ever asked the fish if they like to have excess pasta bolognese? And the fish is not interested in it, but they're giving it and they're claiming in their social responsibility and environmental reports that they're now feeding the fish. I'm sorry. I mean, you can cheat and you can cheat badly. This is badly. This is not just cheating. This is fooling yourself. That's the worst there is. Cheating on someone else and badly cheating on someone else is very bad. But cheating on yourself is the worst that you can do. And what we need to think of is that the shipping industry, including the cruise ships, they have exempted themselves from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. It's the only sector in the world that is not part of the Paris Agreement. I, 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 I must congratulate them for having succeeded in lobbying themselves out and not having had any bad press against them now for two years. I mean, it's really amazing that you can do that. But that is the result. Now, this is why I'm saying, if you look at this, you see the statistics, you see the political action, would you now become a member of Greenpeace and block all the cruise ships? Or would you do this? This is to me life. Life is not going against the bad. Life is not stopping the bad and pointing the finger to those who are not doing good. Life is about showing the good. I have a Christian education, but I'm a Buddhist in soul. You know, I believe that everyone can always do better, even the worst. So as long as we accept that everyone can always do better, always. I mean, that's what Buddha told us. I mean, this is not uh, something so difficult to learn. And if you associate with that a very basic principle, the Christian principles, is that doing bad is bad, doing less bad is bad. But refusing to do good is also bad. And I think this is where we have to have a fundamental shift in our society. We think that doing less bad is good. No, we need to do more good. And so the whole focus of the energy of the science and the entrepreneurship and the culture that is around it for my organizations and the people I love to work with is that uh, we always focus on the good and the positive 
and we just do it. And so here you have a boat that was designed uh, by Swiss, built in Germany, that is going around the world to simply show that it is perfectly possible to go around the world on this trimaran of 36 meters long solely using seawater. Now we know that if you have electricity, 12 volt direct current, you get from your 500 square meters of panels. With that current you electrolyze hydrogen out of the seawater. That means now you have hydrogen and with the hydrogen you can power the boat. And when you power the boat with hydrogen your byproduct is drinking water. I mean, to me it is quite embarrassing that the maritime sector has excluded itself from the Kyoto Protocol, whereas with seawater and solar power you can produce energy and drinking water forever. Now, sun we have, seawater we have. The engineering of the hydrogen is a done deal. We've proven it, we've gone around the world, now we're going the second time around the world. And just in case there is a problem with the engine and the hydrogen and the fuel, you still have a kite. And the kite will pull the boat forward. And the laws of physics have one great advantage, they're very predictable. This is amazing. Laws of physics have no exceptions. Laws of physics always apply. That means that once you pull a kite 150, 250 meters up, the kite will start doing this. And when the kite starts doing this, your cable starts turning around and you're generating electricity. This is the most efficient wind power because you don't have this very heavy head that has to go 100 meters high with these huge things there that are making life for birds just about impossible. This one goes way up and moves around. Now to me this is the message we have to play. Be positive, don't criticize, focus, get it done, inspire. And we're going around the world, we're visiting all the islands in the Pacific, not all islands, all countries in the Pacific Ocean and we're going to show that if you have seawater and sun, you can have power and water. There's no need to invest in desalination. There's no need. There's absolutely no need. Now, if you're in the desalination business and your name is General Electric and Siemens, of course you think there is a need. Because it's your business that you need. But society doesn't need it. Our efficiency is not dependent on lithium battery on the boat because if you were to equip the boat with lithium batteries to power the boat, the boat will sink. But hydrogen is, as we all know from the laws of physics and from chemistry, is the lightest element on Earth. And therefore, if you store energy in the lightest element on Earth, you have an increase of efficiency of energy storage by factor six. One day of sun gives us six days of power to run the boat. Now, it'll take one or two generations before the maritime sector has changed, but at least we know it can be done. And it has been done. And, and this is the spirit that we need. It can be done, and it has been done. Don't debate with me the technicalities. Because now I don't want to discuss science of hydrogen. I don't want to discuss the science of lithium batteries. I don't want to discuss the business model. It's been done, it's cheaper, it is secure, and it's much better for the environment. And we're learning. And I think this is very important. We have to learn from the good. We don't learn enough from the good. So here we are in Latin America. The picture you see is the result of deforestation. But deforestation that, not occur, that did not occur recently, this is deforestation that occurred 250 years ago. Life is just very different. This used to be a rainforest. And the Spanish, Spanish colonizers wanted to produce meat so that the ships would go across the Atlantic with sufficient meat 
for all the all the passengers. They tried and they failed. So it's quite amazing that now we see destruction of the rainforest in Latin America, and that is not a new phenomenon. It started 300 years ago. And the destruction has been going on for 300 years. It's only accelerated a little bit lately because we wanted to have more soy and we wanted to have more corn. Now this forest, this region, we were told you cannot regenerate the forests. Now, there's one very particular characteristic of my personality is that when they tell me it's not possible, I'm interested to do it. I mean, the only thing that interests me is when the science says that the pH is too low, the soil is too thin, the exposure to UV is too high, the torrential rains are too, too aggressive, then what I am very clear about is that there is always a way to say it can be done. And what you're seeing in the picture is the, it's called Bosques de Galeria, the small forests that remained along the rivers, creeks and rivers, and they call it the Riachuelos, small creeks. Around there, biodiversity always throve. The thriving biodiversity along the rivers has never been eradicated. And therefore what we did is we created a bridge. Paolo Lugari, who is the head of this program, who imagined this uh, in, a, in a very creative way, presented this to me in 1984. 1984, 94, 2004, 2000, that is in the meantime, 34 years ago. 34 years ago, I learned that there was a man with an idea that we can regenerate the rainforest. And everyone said, not possible. And I wanted to learn, how can we do it? And the result is that the forest was regenerated. Now, when you have a regenerated forest, and I can't go into the detail, because that in itself is a, is a two-hour lecture. But once you have a forest, what you have immediately is drinking water. Forests are water. Now, when you have a pH of a soil that is four, you will have bad drinking water. You th the wrong bacteria thrive and you will have gastrointestinal diseases. So 70% of the population in the region suffered from gastrointestinal diseases because there was bad water. There was water, but bad water. Now, what are the solutions for bad water? Chemicals. Where did you get the chemicals from? I mean, you're far away from everywhere. So are you now going to pour chlorine in there so that you will have good water? No, because even if you pour in chlorine, the pH too low, you're still damaging the gastrointestinal uh, flora and you are still not securing the health of the people. The health of the people has to be our priority. And that means we have to have water from pH 6.8 and not pH 4. And then, of course, what's the solution that the engineers imagine is throw calcium carbonate massively on that. What, for 20 million hectares? There's no plane that can ever deliver it, no truck that can deliver that. So we need to understand how does nature take care of itself. And nature takes care of itself once the laws of physics are in place. And the laws of physics mean that you need to have shade. Life emerges in the shade, not in the sun, in the shade. You provide shade, life emerges. And, if you need to find, and then you need to find the first one that is strong enough to defy ultraviolet. And there are very few who can do that. So we need to know the pioneer species. Which is the pioneer species? Because if you don't know the pioneer species, nothing else can come. And so that is why it's so important in biology to understand the pioneer species. But we have destroyed the ecosystem to the point that the most obvious pioneer species can't even do it. And in this particular case, the pioneer species became a Caribbean pine tree. And the Caribbean pine tree was planted in a monoculture against all my principles. But it was planted because it was not the biological process we initiated, it was the creation of physical conditions. 
you created shade. And the pine tree didn't create enough coverage, so we had to mistreat the pine tree. And first we cut off the roots so that the mycorrhizal fungi would blossom on the roots, because that's how it would get its nutrition and its water during nine months of, of uh, drought. And then, of course, we chopped up the tops of the little pine tree, so that instead of growing like this, it would grow like that, so it provides more shade. So badly treated treelings of one year that survived this onslaught of uh, bad behavior of us are the ones that were planted, and they created immediately a 50% coverage of the soil. And as soon as that coverage of the soil was there, life emerged. Life emerges. Life is very clear. Once you protect me from UV, then I am with you forever. And so that is what we did. Now we have the water, because once you have the life coming back, and once you invert the temperature, this is very important, regeneration of forests and regeneration of soils for agriculture depends on the inversion of temperatures. I explain. If the sun is hitting the soil direct, the soil will get too hot. If the soil is too hot and there is rainfall, then the rain cannot penetrate and percolate because you have the heat pan effect. Try at home when you have a, a pan on the fire and throw in some water. Pshht. That is what happens. So the earth has not generated a heating effect. We have created a heat pan effect. And the heat pan effect means that when there is rain, the rain hits the soil, can never penetrate the soil. When it can't penetrate the soil, the debris of plants that has already been degraded is washed away and you can never rebuild the topsoil. The crisis of the earth is that we don't understand the physics of regenerating topsoil. We think it's chemistry. Wrong! It's in the first place physics and in the second place chemistry and in the third place biology. And we start with the biology. And then we add the chemistry. That's why it doesn't work. That's why we can't feed the world. That's why topsoil is decreasing. That's why we're losing the biggest carbon sink on earth, on land, topsoil. Because we don't understand the physics. And because our agronomists don't take physics courses. So we need to understand that temperature, delta T, delta T between soil, air, and rain, that determines the regeneration. And if you don't have that clear, nothing works. So we were able to experience it. Today we have 15 centimeters of 30% carbon-rich soil. And we didn't have to do EM. We didn't have to do Bokashi. We didn't have to do anything. Nature did it. The only thing we had to do is protect the soil from the sun with a plant that is enriched with mycorrhizal fungi. The symbiosis of the fungus with the tree is the basis of the chemistry that was required. Now we have 6.8 and now the region is producing drinking water. Gastrointestinal diseases have been eliminated without medicine, not even TCM. We don't even need traditional Chinese medicine. We don't need any medicine, just have clean drinking water for the people in abundance. And everyone in this region receives three liters of drinking water for free. What happens when you drink three liters of water every day and it's your own fresh water that has percolated your soil? We have proven with the 34 years of statistics that the rainfall increases. We've increased rainfall by 10%. I mean, 10% on 60,000 hectares, it's a lot of water. So we have an abundance of drinking water. You know what it means, abundance of drinking water? I mean, you're the wealthiest individual in the world. And so the drinking water is being generated and now we're supplying free drinking water to the local population, but that costs money. And so 10% of the water is sold in Bogota, we're in Colombia, in the capital city, and with that money, we have the funds to distribute water for free. You can run a business model that provides drinking water bottled for free to everyone in the local region. You can do that. Now, if on top of that, every child at the age of six receives a bicycle, 
When children have as a mode of transportation a bicycle and they drink three liters of water a day, what do you have? Healthy kids. That's all we need. Move that body and drink water. And if we have that as the basis of a society, you don't need to have apps and iPhones. You only need to secure first and foremost that there is fresh drinking water that has never been in a bottle for more than a couple hours or days, not more than a few days. Fresh water and a bicycle. We have run this program for decades and we're very proud to share that the local hospital had to be closed for lack of patients. This is sustainable development. Sustainable development is not that you have all the expensive equipment and you have all the beds available. No, 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 no. Sustainable development means that you have resilience in a society that is so good that you don't need a hospital anymore. And everyone becomes their own doctor. I mean, it's better than Cuba, where you have three, for every 350 people one medical doctor. Everyone is a doctor. Why can everyone be a doctor? Because you have taken care of the basic conditions of life, drinking water and exercise. And if we're not doing that, what are we doing? We're defending interests. And what interests? And this is, this is really my, my transformative experience. I've learned a lot from this. I have been more than 50 times to the Vichada. Now we're in the Vichada. We are far away. This is Bogota, and if you take a bus, it'll take another three days in the dry season and 14 days in the rainy season. In the rainy season, the only way you get to the space is by tractor. You can't get it. There's no road. So this taught me that change only happens in the periphery. Never ever think that change, fundamental change, disruptive change, the generation of new values is always created in the periphery, never in the center. That's why I don't believe in these research centers, in these grand institutions. I only believe in research centers in the periphery where there is no one. Because that's where we have to think bottom up and not top down. Of course, I write fables about this. I write children's stories about that. What I've learned over the years is that when I tell the story, people say, that's not possible. I mean, my biggest challenge in life is that people are ignorant, and when I tell them it's possible, they don't believe it. And we've become non-believers, because it hasn't, you can't Google this on the internet. And since it doesn't pop up with about 35 references, on the internet, it is not true. It is not real. Our only way to react against that is to bring people there. Every year we have 25, 30 people we bring there so they can see it. Because only seeing is believing these days. No, 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 no. That used to be seeing is believing. Now it's on Google and now you believe it. That's why we can spread so much false news because people can put on there whatever they want. No one needs to see anymore. Everyone just only Googles. And if it's Googled, then it's true. So I write fables. Why do I write fables? First of all, because I have six children. I mean, with six children, I gotta tell stories to my own kids first. And I don't wanna tell stories uh, from old days, I wanna tell the stories of today. My stories don't end by saying, and they married and had children and lived happily ever since. No. Because no one marries, has children, and lives happily ever since. That's when mess starts. So what I want to make certain is that they realize that when you are coming to a point in life, every time it only has just begun. It's only just started. And to me, that is one of the core principles in life. Every day is life as if it has just started. There's nothing you can stand on. Everything has to be rethought every day. And as long as you impose it on yourself, so therefore I tell the stories. And the stories are that what my peers tell me is fantasy, is reality. 
But what my peers don't realize is the world they live in is fantasy. The today's world as we live it is pure fantasy. It doesn't exist. We're consuming the earth. And that's fantasy. The reality is a new one. And therefore, I need to talk to children because children, they do not differentiate between fantasy and reality. For children, everything is reality. And that's the power of a child. Because as a child recognizes that everything is reality, even Superman and Batman is reality. And even Spider-Man is reality. And even cars that talk to each other is reality. And that's fine. But I can talk to the children and inspire them to the point that I'm more interesting than Spider-Man. And when I talk to them about it, and they talk to their parents, they realize that their parents live in a world of fantasy. Because the life that we're leading is fantasy and has no future. Let's travel to another part of the world. And since uh, I knew about your interest in agriculture, I thought I'd share a few facts about agriculture. Maybe we have to talk about some hard facts. Uh, I, I'm, I'm vegetarian. Um, thank you. Very hot. Thank you. Um, I do eat meat, but only when it's game. I only eat wild meat. I only need meat from sources where you need to cull the animals, where you need to create a balance of life in the ecosystems by culling animals. It's the only meat that I eat. So I'm not absolute. I think when people are absolute, um, then you're missing life. It can't be absolute. There's always a moment that there is an exception. But to me, the biggest challenge is that for every kilogram of meat, we need 15,000 liters of water. The world just doesn't have the water anymore. But if you're vegetarian and you like chocolate, then unfortunately you need 17,500 liters. So, so don't start criticizing the meat eaters. Don't start criticizing the chocolate munchers. I mean, everyone can always, according to the opinion of someone else, do bad. And so that's not, again, where we want to focus on. We don't want to do the analysis of everyone who's using too much water, eating too much meat and eating too much chocolate. That's not the issue. The issue is what are we going to do about our food? One kilogram of tomatoes needs 210 liters of water. So it's already 20 years ago that we asked ourselves the question and I had access to this incredible scientist called Charlie Patton from the United Kingdom. He was a light engineer. He knew nothing about farming, but he knew about light. And Charlie Patton had a clarity in his mind when he visited the Canary Islands in Spain that actually there is no need to use water. You can produce water while farming tomatoes. Now, when you throw them on a table and you're having the best agronomist around the table, they of course declare you nuts. You're persona non grata. You are just for the dungeon. Because who can ever claim that you produce water with agriculture? While the whole world knows that 70% of water consumption is dedicated to agriculture. So how would you ever dare? Well, we've got to go back to laws of physics. And it's always the same. If you want to change things in agriculture, think laws of physics. And so here, without going through the scheme on the picture, is a very simple principle. When you have a cold glass of lemon juice and you're sitting on the beach and it's a nice warm day, what happens to the glass? It sweats. It condensates. The outside condensates. And <clears throat> you don't have to be a great engineer to realize that this is a very simple process. It's again the same, delta T temperature differential. What's the temperature inside the glass? What's the temperature outside the glass? So the technology has been implemented at very large scale in Hawaii, at smart, smaller scale in Qatar and in Tenerife, and at a medium scale in Port Augusta 
Australia. And what do you do? Whenever you're going 10 meters down the water, in the sea, salt water, it's cold. I mean, you can't be there for too long because you will die from hypothermia. So you have the cold water, you pump it up, you let it flow through the sand and the soil. It doesn't have to be even soil, it can just be sand. You let it flow through and you let it flow back into the sea. Now, you know the law of communicating vessels? You know, that doesn't need a lot of pumping. Once it flows, it keeps on flowing. Provided there is a temperature difference. So what you're doing is on one side the pipes are white and on the other side the pipes are black. And black pipes will cause for an expansion of the water and therefore once you started pumping it will pump itself. Laws of physics. Delta T again. Because if you have a difference in temperature you have a difference in density of the water. These are the basic things that every child learns in middle school. But then when we're engineers we only pump against the law of gravity and we don't go with the communicating vessels. Short story, put simple. When you have cold water going through the land, what do you have? You change the dew point you have irrigation. And if you create the right type of environment, an open greenhouse, not a closed greenhouse, an open greenhouse where air can continue to come in, we know that if you have a certain humidity in the air, as soon as the air is inside, the humidity will drop because it's condensating, it will automatically pull the air from the outside back in. And you have a continuous cycle of water generation onto your crops. You change the humidity levels. And how do you control it? By controlling the flow of the water. Physics. You just need to control the flow. Now, this in theory was tested in 2009 on 2,000 square meters. The tanks you see in front are water tanks with water that is generated thanks to the farming of tomatoes. I mean, it's nice, because we know that if we can turn farming from a net water guzzling to a net water production, we've changed the world. And so this is the picture now. 17,000 tons of tomatoes are produced and for every kilogram of tomatoes, four liters of water is produced. Don't tell me it's not possible. It is done. Don't tell me the project is small. 17,000 tons per year is a large farm. To me what is very important is that on top of it, it has its own energy. You create your own water, you create your own energy, you produce tomatoes, you turn land that was infertile into fertile land, you turn seawater that was considered useless for farming into useful for farming. That means that any coastal zone anywhere in the world where you're going to have rising sea levels and where you're going to have a loss of uh, farming land, you should rejoice because thanks to the increased sea levels you will have closer access to water and you will be able to farm at productivity levels that we have not seen before. This is reality. Now, of course, tomato farming today is in a world of total fantasy because all tomato farms around the world are depleting water sources, are all fighting blight with metal oxides. And even those who are labeled organic in the United States have the right to use metal oxides as an exception just in case. Organic basically means that you certify what you did not do. It doesn't tell you what you're doing. And the thing, therefore, we need to come to terms that we've got to do much better than we've known until today. 
This little farm alone is a delta of three million tons of water. Three million tons of water delta. I mean, can we turn the world around? Easy. Don't tell me it's difficult. Don't tell me there's a crisis. There's a crisis that we don't believe this can be done. That's the real crisis. The reality is it's done. And of course, I wrote a fable about that. I mean, we got to tell the story to the kids. Because the kids don't understand that when you can farm tomatoes and have water, why does the whole world continue to pour water on tomatoes? I mean, kids don't get it. I mean, it seems to be pretty obvious. If this can be done, why don't you do it? And this is indeed where we have what we call this, the technological institutional lock-in. There is a lock-in. People don't want to change because they're making money on the existing system and they don't want to change to a new system. They're sitting in air-conditioned atmospheres and for the time being they can just continue earning the money. And because we're sitting in these air-conditioned atmospheres and we have the allies both in distribution, in politics, uh, in local governments, in national governments, in you name it, whatever it is. And of course you have an alliance with the science. This outdated science that is not ready to embrace the new. I don't know why this tomato farm is not inundated with visitors. Inundated with visitors. The best we can do is have a little look at it on Google, and that's it. And then we move on and we do more of the same. One of our very important initiatives is the management of islands in water. For us, islands are, they're the microcosm. I mean, the smallest is our boat, but then it's an island. And so we think it's very important to be able to rethink how an island of only 60 square kilometers could be turned sustainable. Most of the islands are going dead because people don't want to live on islands anymore. Just like with uh, rural areas far away, people don't want to live there because they don't think there's life. Actually, it's the only place where there is life. I and mean, it's the only place where you can live. The problem is that the conditions of life that have been proposed to us through media with an excessive Americanization of the logic is a life that has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with consumption, it has to do with ego, it has to do with possessions. And so when I looked at this island and I was there for the first time, we, we realized that the islanders were convinced that within one generation, no one would live on the island anymore. Now, this is the island where Christopher Columbus left to go to America. That was the last stop in Europe. This is where all the ships were put full food on board because 30,000 people on the island could use this island so productively that every ship going to America was fully loaded with food. And that island today has no more future. Why? Because we take the plane? No, it's because we have projected life in air-conditioned atmospheres. Now, if you want to revive an island, you want to revive an economy, you have to start at the roots of that economy. And in an island economy, always, the roots of an island economy is always fishing. And that's life. Is there's no fish. So when we realize that the fish stock is depleted, like everywhere else in the world, nothing new, overfishing is our standard, we analyze the situation and we realize the very simple hard fact. And the hard fact is that we not only fish, we fish and kill females with eggs. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't know if we realize this, huh? how barbarian fishermen we are. We've been fishing for 6,000 years and we do not discriminate between a female and a male fish. I mean, I, I just want to ask your indulgence. Do you know what it means if I were a farmer and I have a cow and the cow is going to have a calf within a week 
and I take the cow with the cow still in her belly to the butcher and say slaughter. I would be considered a barbarian. I may end up in jail in the United Kingdom or in Germany. But with fish, no problem. Now what's the difference? How come we have a fishing technique where we're looking at kilos of fish and we don't realize that a female of one kilogram has two to three thousand eggs. A female of ten kilograms may have a million eggs. A sunfish, a sunfish which is 800 kilograms, the female will have 300 million eggs and we kill her. I mean, we should be putting these people in jail. I mean, I'm sorry, at least one night. At least one night in jail. Because so, how can we have sustainable fisheries? It's not about overfishing. It's about fishing the females with eggs and killing her. That is the drama of our society. And so when I write a fable about not fishing the females with eggs anymore, for, for kids it's the most obvious thing. I mean, how could my dad ever have caught a female with eggs? killed her and sold the eggs. That you cannot get into the mindset of any child. That you can only get in the mindset of the homo non-sapiens. Because we call ourselves the homo sapiens. We're not homo sapiens. We're homo non-sapiens. We have no clue what we do. We behave like barbarians and we think we're culture. To me, fish is the most clear example of how barbarian our society continues to behave. If we do not protect the female fish from the fishermen, we will never have fish in the future. Sustainable fishery starts with saving the female with eggs. And that means you've got to drop the nets. And so we did drop the nets. Then, of course, the question is, well, what do you do now? Well, first thing you drop the nets and you secure that you will only have line fishing so you can check. Oh, female with eggs. Please go back to life. Give life. We created a zone. The picture was here. We create that little red zone on the bottom there. That little red zone is a five square kilometer zone where fish are brooding. The fishermen know where the females are brooding. So we created a five kilometer square kilometer zone where no one is permitted to come in. No one. Not even you naked swimming. No one. Never. And the result is that the fish figured this out very quickly. This is a safe haven. This is where we put our eggs. And we do know that when there are a thousand eggs that there are only one or two percent will hatch. It's fine. That's life. The rest is rich protein for other fish. But we do know that when you have only small fishes producing eggs, your chance of recovering your fish tox is very low. But if you have grandma fish laying the millions of eggs, mathematics are very straightforward. You will recover. And today, in that area, you have a fish stock which is 10 times higher than 25 years ago. Don't tell me we can't regenerate fish stocks. Don't tell me we can't. Don't tell me we have pushed them to the edges. No, nature is smart. And nature knows how to rebound, even from volcano eruptions and meteorites. And maybe the dinosaur will not come back, but life comes back. And so therefore, we need to understand how can we create safe havens for life. And that is not in a laboratory, that is not in a zoo, that is not on another planet. That is here where we are. And so the inspiration for going forward is of course the whale. Whales have been fishing for millions of years. Whales and dolphins, they've never used a net or a hook. They use air bubbles. And there is something smart in how nature designs again solutions for food using the laws of physics. Because what happens when you have an air bubble in the water? It goes up. And what happens to the fish 
that get caught in between. Depending on the size of the air bubble, small fishes are pushed up. Big fishes don't bother. So the mama and the grandma fish, which is big and heavy, will not be pushed up by the air bubbles that are only the small ones that are pushed all the way up. And those, the ones that are pushed up, are very easily eaten by the dolphins and are very easily picked up by the whales. It's very simple. Fishing is laws of physics. I mean, did you know this? Do you realize how smart nature is? Nature designs for older females with lots of eggs not to get caught into the food chain. And of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. That's how nature works as well. But the core laws of physics are very clear. So here we have a beautiful picture of one of the grandma fishes. On the island Neliero, where we did the initiative. And now once a year, there is the right to go inside the five square kilometer reserve to take picture of the fish. And now we have pictures of all these grandmas who are loved and respected and who have all gotten a name. And you know what happens when a human being gives a name to an animal? It will not kill it nor eat it. The moment you give an animal a name, you don't kill or eat it. You let it lead its biological life. And I think this is really where we have been able to demonstrate again that the shift is possible. Now, once you have the fishermen doing the line fishing, and once the grandmas can lay the eggs, you recover your fish stocks, you have a different type of fish. Unfortunately, science tells us that we can catch the, the, the big fishes, but we can't catch the small fishes. I do not know who is the biologist behind it, but it is clear myopia. It is clear not seeing, because big fishes should never be caught. Female big fishes should let live. You should let them live forever. You should only catch the small ones, and particularly the small males. They're useless. Eat them. No problem. Let's go and look at a very different project. I just want to go through a few of our projects. And uh, Casey, I want to show projects you haven't seen in my other lecture, you know, because otherwise it gets boring if you see the same cases. This is how a mine looks like. Mines destroy life. Now, we need the cell phones, right? And we need the computers, and we need these cameras, and so we're in need of metals, and we need to mine. I'm not against mining. I'm against bad mining. Mining can be done, but there is no need to accumulate wastes so that for the next couple hundred years, kids can have asthma and the population can suffer from respiratory diseases. There's no need to do that. And it's not because you know how to plant a tree on top of it that the things is resolved. Remediation is not planting a tree. Remediation is generating value. And this is one of the core principles that we adhere to. So here we are having a look at a calcium carbonate factory. Calcium carbonate, which needs to be burned, is important for the metallurgic industry, for the cement industry. We can't do without it. But it creates an awful lot of dust. So I was very pleased when a Chinese team of researchers, combined with some very, very astute businessmen from Taiwan decided to take the dust and convert it to paper. Now, I think that we have to always have clarity of what are some of the big issues of life. And one of the big issues is soil, regenerating soil, and one of the big issues is water. Now, when you explain to a child that an A4, a piece of paper A4, requires 14 liters of water and that you need to cut 20 
trees in order to have one ton of paper, a child doesn't understand why you continue to do it when you can take the dust from the air, from those mines, clean the air, avoid asthma, stop the risk of respiratory diseases and create a paper with zero water and zero tree cutting. I mean, again, this sounds for most of the people like fantasy. This is not possible. This is another world. Well, the reality is that in China, production level this year reaches a million tons. Now, a million tons basically means that you are taking waste and converting it into a product. Now, paper made from rocks, because this is fine dust, the fine dust was originally a rock that got crushed. Making paper from rocks means that you have a mineral and that means it can be recycled forever. Now, I don't know if we realize this. When you have a tree, you cut a tree, you can recycle the paper with a lot of water and de-inking and creating a lot of toxicity, but you can only recycle it three, four, five times. When it's a mineral, you can recycle forever. I mean, wow, forever? Yeah, 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 yeah. A couple of thousand years from here, we can still be using the same paper. This is amazing. Why isn't the whole world embracing this? On top of that, you don't need to cut a tree and you don't need to use water. Somehow the world has again these interests that say we will continue with the trees. We got too many trees, we got to cut our trees. I don't understand it. The earth has lost, lost more than 50% of its tree cover. We urgently should regenerate the tree cover, the natural tree cover, not the GMO tree cover. The real forest should be given a chance to regenerate themselves, provided we generate the physical conditions that will make it possible, even if there is no topsoil. And we think that this is one of the greatest challenges. There's 400 million tons of paper consumed every year, and at least half of that can be produced with stone paper. Half. This is the future. China is creating it. China learned about it. And by 2019, the textbooks in China will be printed on stone paper. And don't think it's stone paper, so therefore it's heavy. It doesn't feel like a rock. Because you can very easily inject tiny air bubbles into your paper. Because paper today is made as a flotation. You take cellulose, 99% water, 1% fibers, and you float. Paper is made floating. The new paper made from these finely ground rocks is paper that is extruded. And in the extrusion process, you can inject tiny air bubbles. That means your weight of paper from cellulose is the same as the weight from rocks, thanks to a very simple ingredient called air. Sounds like fantasy? Sounds like something that can never ever be reality. Well, it, but it is already reality. It is done. It is industrialized. It is not a tiny project in a lab where in a typical communication fashion we put massive attention to so that we think that this small little tiny thing in a laboratory somewhere in America or in Europe is going to change the world. No, it is million ton production facility. Of course I've written a fable about that. And all my fables are printed on stone paper. You know, when I have my 365 fables ready by 2022, the Chinese government has asked me to do 365 fables. And this year we'll finish 216. In 2018, 216 fables, written and published. We're really creating a new world. Because in the minds of these children that have gone to 216 in the future 365 fables, that's a real world. That's all real. 
and we're describing the beauties of nature, the surprises of nature, and we're describing the implementations that we've already done. And stone paper is one of them. But I was just reflecting on the menu in the restaurant yesterday, and I realized that one of the prime dishes of the restaurant was hand harvested scallops. It seems to be a new fashion in Hong Kong that you don't have farm raised scallops but that people go around the sea and look for the wild ones and that they are hand cut. Now I do not know how you can ever eat a scallop because the scallop is the only animal that has a hundred eyes. It has a hundred eyes and in every eye, there are about a million tiles that gives it a telescope vision. I mean, when you know that this scallop is capable of putting in each of its hundred eyes a million mirrors in a telescope vision, then we realize that we're eating a genius. Do you want to eat Einstein? I, uh, when I talk about Einstein, I don't get the appetite to eat him. I mean, I can admire and I can learn, but I don't, certainly don't want to eat. And I think this is the kind of level of inspiration that we need to bring to kids. You look at a scallop, a hundred eyes, and each eye with a million mirrors inside, so it can see when there's turbidity and it knows where the predator is coming from. Amazing! And this is what we have to bring to kids. It's the amazing stone paper, and this is the fable I just finished last night. After seeing this on the menu, I, I could not stop not writing about this, because I was surprised that no one knew. Did you know that a scallop has 100 eyes? Did you know that it has telescope vision? Not one, 100. You know, that a telescope uh, that we use to look into the black hole costs 180 million dollars, one, and it has six mirrors, or eight mirrors, and this is able to make that from guaranine, which is a very simple protein that is made in the sea at ambient temperature and ambient pressure, whereas the other one costs eight million apiece for one mirror. I mean, who's the smart one? Who's intelligent? Who's the engineer? I mean, it's obvious the scallop is the engineer of the world. If you want to design telescopes, you better study scallops. Don't eat them with butter and herbs. Every story that I tell, I have to talk about the chickens and the pigs. I mean, I love pigs. I mean, pigs are smart. I mean, they're intelligent, but the real intelligence is this love affair between the chicken and the pig. Uh, and you can imagine I've written fables about chickens and pigs living happily together. I mean, when you put the chickens alone in a small cage, they will pick each other. I mean, I would do the same if I was put in a cage. I mean, I would get very upset and start being naughty. And if you put a couple, if you could put a couple of pigs in a very small space, of course I would bite the curly tail of my neighbor. Of course I would do that. And what is the human reaction to this behavior? We cut off the beak of the chicken and we cut off the tail of the pig. That's how we react. While we don't reflect on how have we changed the living conditions of a pig. Now, why does the pig and the chicken love each other? because they're symbiotic. They, they give services to each other. I mean, this is very important. I mean, you always like to be with a partner who does things for you and you do things for the partner. I mean, what else is marriage about? I mean, is it only love? No, you do great things for each other and that's why you care for each other. And you don't even have to ask for it, it's done immediately. So when the pig is full of parasites because it's nicely muddling around in the dirt, then the chicken is delighted to come by and eat all the parasites, all the insects. So a pig with chickens around will never have a parasite. Never. The chicken will eat them. It's a very nice service, isn't it? And for the pig, it's like a massage. I mean, the pig just lets the chicken do. 
and it will go in every single hole, even into its nose, if it sees something in there. And the pig knows that it will only pick the insect that's in there, and it will not bother the skin. Ah, accidents happen. That's true. But you know, these are accidents, and the pig knows it as well. And so, the living conditions of the pigs and the chickens have changed. I mean, look at these little houses. Bottom floor for the pigs, top floor for the chickens. And why is that? Could I have some more as well, please? Why would you have pigs and, pigs and chickens live together? Well, very simple that because pigs in the winter time are still warm blooded and give off a lot of heat, thank you, and give off, off a lot of heat. The chickens, they're a bit colder, and that's why in the winter time chickens don't lay so many eggs because they're too cold. I mean, I would not lay eggs if I had a cold bum as well. I mean, that's very obvious. But when the chicken can sleep over and above the pigs, it's nice and warm and they lay more eggs. It's a very simple symbiosis. You give me heat, I'll eat your parasites and your insects. Now, according to European legislation, this is not permitted. I mean, you can't have pigs and chickens together. I mean, you don't have to be a virologist to know that hoof and mouth disease doesn't pass to chickens and chickens don't give their avian flu to pigs. And if the chickens have avian flu, it's because we have genetically modified the chicken to the point that we have given it feed it never eaten before and we've secured that the chickens today has an obesity gene so they get fat fast. In 32 days, fattened chicken is an obese chicken and they've been genetically selected in order to have obesity. And then we're surprised that people are obese. I mean, this is all the chickens are like that. So, what do we realize? we realize that we increase the productivity of the chickens and we have a lower cost. But second, there is a tiny problem with pigs that is a major cost factor. Is that pigs today, I'm sorry to say the way it is, but pigs poo anywhere. Pigs go when they have to go. Unless you teach them how to do it. And we have been amazed that the pig you can teach in three days to go to the toilet. I always admit that it took me a little bit longer to figure out how to go to the toilet. And I think maybe for you as well. It takes months for us to figure out how to go to the toilet. Pigs, three days, clean. You know, and it's a very simple procedure. I've learned it in rural China. I mean, they take six pigs, piglets of one month old. They have a concrete floor. They will create a wooden cover, just the size for three little wieners. And they will hunger out the pig, the little wiener, first taken from the mom. Give dry food. When they have dry food, they're horrible, they're terrified. And then they learn to drink from the nozzle. And if they have the dry food in the tummy and they drink, everything expands and they need to run to the toilet. And when they run to the toilet, we tell them it's in the corner that there's the toilet. And the little piglet that goes to the corner first and does in the corner will sleep on the wooden berth. And the second one on the wooden berth. And the third one on the wooden berth. And the three that were too late and pooed wherever they thought was the right place to poo, they sleep on the concrete. Pigs understand this very well. Next day, same procedure, four beds. Next day, same procedure, five beds. And the one who did not get it right the first and the second day, I guarantee you, the third day, it knows exactly what it's got to do. Eat, drink, poo, sleep. You know what it means when you don't have to clean up anymore a pig pen? You know what it means when you don't have to clean up after the pigs? I mean, this is a different pig pen. This is a different hygiene management. Completely changed around. Now it is so simple. Why don't we take the three days? Now a pig normally is fattened in six months. Three days is not so long. So in three days we can turn to teach them how to be clean. You have changed completely the life of the workers of a pig farm. Because no pig farm worker enjoys 
cleaning up after the pigs. This is not fun. This is something you do. But once you're clean, now you have the greatest biodigesters that has never been actually contaminated with a lot of other matter. But now we've decided that the pigs should live through the whole cycle. It's just like an, a banana. A banana that is harvested when it's green needs ethylene gas to be able to ripen. If you don't pour the banana into ethylene gas, it will never ripen, it will stay green. So what we need to do is we harvest the banana, we put it into a plastic, we gas it up, and so by the time it arrives in Europe, it'll be ripe. Who wants to eat that banana? Not me. But we do the same with pigs. The pigs are, we pump them up to the point that after six months we can slaughter them. And of course, they don't have very good meat, so we need to put in some color pigment so it's nice and pinky because pig meat of six months is only gray. You need one year to have pinky, natural pinky. And of course, the taste is not so good, so you, when you slaughter them, you pump them up with water with a lot of sugar in it so that the pork actually tastes good. It's not good. This is the meat we eat. What we have done is we let the pig live for a year so that just like the banana that needs to ripen, the pig needs to come to maturity as well. And when you let a pig come to maturity, it will have so many micronutrients that we understand why the pig was the favorite food. Because pigs of one year have a multiple of the nutrients that you could ever get from a pig of six months. But unfortunately, we're buying pork by the kilo and not by nutrition. I mean, something strange in our mind, right? Are you interested in a kilo of pork meat or are you interested in the nutrition the pork gives you? And unfortunately, we're buying kilos and we don't worry about the nutrition. The fat content, sorry, the beta-carotene content, the omega-3 content, particularly the omega-3 content of a pig in its fat, is better than you could ever get from a salmon if the pig is let live for one year. Now, you're flying in salmon frozen from Norway to get omega-3. And that salmon got omega-3 because we are overfishing herrings and anchovies and sardines in Peru. We're emptying the seas of Peru to feed the salmon in Norway so that you can serve it with omega-3 on your plates. I don't get it. I mean, if you want to have a lesson in stupidity, analyze this. It doesn't make any sense to overfish in Peru to feed Norwegian salmon so the Chinese can have omega-3. You can have omega-3 from your healthy pigs. And if you look at the money that some Chinese are ready to spend, and some Europeans and some Africans and some Americans are ready to spend on salmon, then we realize that we're on the wrong track. And that way we can never get to sustainability. Of course I've written fables about that. I've all, I mean, I call it, I am bored. Yeah, if you're bored, then you do funny things, like biting the tail of your neighbor. But everyone is welcome is also a very important message. Because today, the chickens we have are, bre are bred, one for the meat, the other one for the egg. But of course, the ones you breed for the egg, there are still some males, and we shred them to death. Shred them to death. I mean, 2018, we shred animals to death because we don't know what to do with them, and after shredding them, we turn them into dog food. I don't get it. I'm sorry. When you read dog food, chicken for your dog, that is shredded one-day chickens. I don't know what you want to give to your dog, but that's not what I want to give. How are we doing on time? It's okay. Are you okay? You need a break? No? No, no, as long as I got tea, then I'm fine.
The reason why I accepted the invitation of the Chinese University was that 25 years ago I was at the Chinese University and I learned from an extraordinary professor, Chang Shuting. I learned about how he imagined farming mushrooms on coffee. And it was an amazing thought. I mean, I never came up with that idea. It's uh, Chang Shu Ting who came up with the idea. Because he was worried that when the Chinese start drinking coffee, what are we going to do with all the waste from the coffee? And for him, as a biologist, he quickly analyzed that coffee is ideal substrate for mushrooms. And so he thought, we've got to do mushrooms with it. We took that idea forward, but we've been pushing it and pushing it forward because we very often forget that if you drink a cup of coffee, you only ingest in your body 0.2%. 99.8% stays in the filter or has been processed at the factory so that you can have your instant coffee. Only the small soluble part is used and everything else is wasted. Grandma, grandma knows extremely well that if you have a bad smell in your refrigerator, you put in some coffee and the smell is gone. It doesn't work with tea, coffee. And why is it? Because coffee is the product of a fermentation. Ah, fermentation again. Yeah. Coffee first needs to be fermented, and after fermentation, coffee goes through a semi-carbonization. And that creates a geometry of a molecular structure that is ideal for the absorption of odors. One, it gives a nice odor itself, but it absorbs odors. And since it absorbs odors, it's ideal for putting in the fridge, or, like my friend Jason Chen in Taipei, he puts it into textiles and makes it into clothing that, as the slogan says, you drink your coffee and then you wear your clothing with 6% coffee inside. The geometry of coffee is an extraordinary geometry. May I remind you that I think first physics, then chemistry, then biology. The geometry of the molecular structure of coffee is what makes it unique, not the bean, the geometry. And once we understand the geometry, we realize that there is so much more possible. Coffee absorbs odor, but also because of the molecular structure, clothing that has been laced with coffee grounds inside the fiber dries faster. And faster drying means save energy. And coffee has the capacity of blocking ultraviolet, not with metal oxides. Now these are three characteristics of physics. So coffee gives you physical effects. So we, we worked on the mushrooms. The waste of the coffee after harvesting the mushrooms is enriched with amino acids, so it's a great feed for an animal. We can lace it into clothing. We can put it into carpets. We can blend it in insulation material like polyurethane. And you can put it into paint. I mean, that's what coffee can do. It's one of the greatest chemicals. Millions of tons of coffee today are discarded, rotting, or burned. And I don't understand. You know, whenever the human being doesn't know what to do with something, it throws it away or burns it. I mean, I know we invented fire, but why do we have to burn everything? And now, all the refuse of cities should go into big incinerators so we can recover energy. No, 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 no. We're not recovering energy. We're making the waste smaller and more toxic. That's the logic of burning. Make it smaller and more toxic. We look at coffee and say that the millions of tons can generate millions of tons of food. If you have one kilogram of coffee, you can generate on the waste of the coffee 500 kilograms of mushrooms. I mean, can we, can, may I repeat that? One kilogram 
of coffee that you ingested in your cup has generated 500 kilograms of waste, because it's 0.2%. And that 500 kilograms generates for you 500 kilograms of mushrooms, which then can be used to generate 150 kilograms of feed for chickens. I mean, this is almost biblical. I mean, I don't know if you're Christian or not, but maybe you've heard the story that Christ, Jesus Christ was at this place and there was not enough food and at once there were more fishes and at once there was more bread. This is not a miracle, this is just the way nature works. I mean, the story is a real story because we start with a cup of coffee and we generate more mushrooms, we generate more food for the chickens, and now the chicken is giving me an egg. I mean, this is the cascading of nature. This is actually what nature does all the time, by design, by virtue. And I think this is very important to understand, that if we break out of this core business, core competence model, if we break out of this ridiculous focus of only one thing at a time, we are able to generate so much more food that, yeah, we can feed 10 billion people with healthy food, not with food, with healthy food. And you don't have to be a vegetarian for that, because the chicken will eat something that actually no one else will eat. And so the chicken has a right to live as well. I mean, we get our kingdoms of nature. To me, this uh, opportunity has led us to continuously search for new things. When we have an innovation and we implement it, we want more innovation. We know that if you succeeded on breaking through, we need to follow an evolutionary path. You can't stop. I mean, Evolution was not, oh, I figured out how to do photosynthesis, so now I'm only doing photosynthesis. No! I mean, much more has been invented by plants than photosynthesis. And I think this is again what we, when we have an innovation, unfortunately business today stops. Because it has a business and it wants to extract all the possible cash from that particular business. No! Create obsolescence, make yourself obsolete, always invent new things that are much better and keep your mind going. It's the only way we're going to avoid Alzheimer and Parkinson. If we are sleeping in and living in our air-conditioned atmospheres, so here is the green bean. The problem of the green bean is that we're creating packaging. So we're roasting the green bean into, we're taking the green bean, we roast the bean and then we package it in an aluminum capsule, in a plastic bottle, a can, or we put it into these horrible vacuum packs with aluminum, plastics, paper, PVC, and of course we need to gas it in order to stay fresh. Who wants that coffee? Who wants to have coffee that has been gassed for months? And then we say, oh, what a good taste. It's nothing to do with taste. So, we wondered, what would it take not to have all this packaging? It would mean that we do not bring to the people in their home a, a roasted bean, a ground bean, but we bring to them a green bean. And the green bean that we've designed is a bean that goes into a good old Melita filter. The good old filter that has been used for century. And that Melita filter is packed at the farm and allows us to get the filter at home, shipped straight from the farmer, no intermediaries, and you tear off the top and there's a little radio frequency, RF code, and the machine will read where the coffee came from, who's the farmer, when it was harvested, how you should roast it according to the farmer, but you can change your mind and you can do what you want. And that goes into a machine that will roast the coffee, grind the coffee, 
and make your coffee. There's only one condition. You pay for the green bean the same price as for the roasted bean. You don't pay anything else. The farmer only gets four times more. Four times more! I mean, when have farmers got the news that they get four times more? I mean, that doesn't exist. Farmers are the only ones in the world who are supposed to submit themselves to the world commodity market. What the world market is ready to pay. Out of the way! Farmers should never submit themselves to the commodity market. Farmers should submit themselves to what the consumer is willing to pay. That's the real market. And today we have the access. So this machine, which has come into the market uh, last year, is a machine that allows farmers to get out of poverty by having a direct sale. Direct. And I think this is where revolution will start. So we've looked at the waste of the coffee, and from that we do the mushrooms, and now we've looked at the green beans, and now we have coffee in paint, and coffee in cars, and coffee in clothing, and coffee in carpets, and coffee in mushrooms, and we get it all. We're rethinking coffee. The world of coffee has never been the same, and will never be the same again. Of course, Nestle and Nespresso doesn't think this makes any sense. And I agree, from their point of view, this does not make any sense. So, let them call it nonsense. But I write a story about this. And we got some partners. So that we are able to collect all the data. What we're really doing is collecting data from farmer to consumer. And that has never been collected before. And this is the kind of thinking. We're not only about the farmer. We're not only about nature. We're not only about regeneration. We are also big data. But big data at the service of the common good. Not big data to be mined and to be exploited. We need big data that is at the service of the people. And that brings me to one of the biggest projects that we're doing today. I'm bringing together, and I hope also with your help, and with the people in the audience, I need communities that want to change the internet. What internet system that we have today, thank you, the internet system we have today is from Stone Age. I'm looking around this room and I'm sure there is a Wi-Fi connection. I'm seeing that there is a camera there that's connected to Wi-Fi. I see another camera there. I'm looking where is the Wi-Fi. Where is it? Where is it? Do you know it? Just outside the room. You see, we've put everywhere a Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a wireless communication. And the word, the word Wi-Fi was a play on hi-fi. And hi-fi stood for high fidelity. The high fidelity to the original sound. Wi-Fi is wireless fidelity. Is how do we have the truth of the message coming through a wireless communication. We think the future is li-fi. Is information comes to you in its original form through light. I mean, may I remind you of the laws of physics? The fastest speed measured by humanity is the speed of light. Well, middle school, we learn that. 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, have you been in a conference where you have someone speaking in front and then there is this big screen behind it? 
and the person speaks and the mouth is slower? I mean, even in a conference room we have that problem because the speed of sound is different from the speed of light. Simple as that. And so we all get a little bit uncomfortable when we hear that. The only thing we have to do is to bring the sound over light. And if I look at this room, I see that there are one, two, three, that's six, nine, twelve, fifteen, thirty. There are fifty LED lamps here. And each LED lamp, I can't look at them too long, is five lamps. That's 250 lamps. I can have 250 people in this room and each one has a unique ISP connection with one of those tiny lamps and we can have internet connectivity at the speed of light. You know what it means when you're only two meters away and it's 300,000 kilometers per second? This is fast. Do you know what it means when you have a radio wave. How many frequencies are there in a radio wave? A couple thousand. How many frequencies are there in light? Billions. So, laws of physics tell me that a radio frequency with a couple thousand frequencies versus light with a couple billion frequencies, doesn't it make sense we communicate over light? Actually, Graham Bell had the photophone and he had the telephone. And the telephone made it because he couldn't get the lights. Edison made lights that were hot and gave a little bit of light, but he couldn't use it at all for communication. It only was when Mr. Shuji Nakamura, the inventor of the LED, Mr. Nakamura, he put a chip behind the diode and was able to modulate the flickering of the diode so you would have light from a diode and we called it cold light. It's not that cold yet because the chip still gets hot. But basically we had this revolution and now when you see light you have the incredible possibility to use a billion frequencies at 300,000 kilometers per second, this is internet of the future. This is real internet. The only thing is we have to shift from radio to light. Have you heard of light-based internet? It's existing since 2005. But of course we have a few people who have an interest that this does not happen because those who pay billions for a 5G license will lose their business and therefore they don't want this. But every spot of light has the same capacity of transmission as a satellite. Why do we put satellites in orbit when every light can do what a satellite does? And that is the basic statement. Every light bulb can be transformed into a satellite. Now, can we again go back to the laws of physics? If I have a satellite 20, 30 kilometers above the Earth, and I must triangulate in order to give you the GPS position in your car, isn't it normal that I have a few meters of error? 30, 30. Of course I have a few meters of error. And I need a third satellite to be able to be a bit more precise, but I'm still meters apart. And that's fine when you're going from Beijing to Hong Kong. That's close enough, you will find a way. But when I'm sitting in this room and I'm a visually impaired person and I want to take a seat, one meter imprecise is not good enough because that means as a visually impaired person I'm on the floor and I'm not on the chair. Because I'm not able to get the instructions of where is my geolocation, where is my position. With light I can give a one centimeter precise location of every object in this room. 
every object in the room and I can transmit that information at 300,000 seconds, kilometers per second. I mean, this is the level of revolution we're looking at and this is why I want people to wake up and say, Wi-Fi, dinosaur, history. I am not saying that we're eliminating Wi-Fi. I'm saying it will not be our prime form of communication. Amongst others because it's unhealthy, but amongst others because it's not as performant. Now the greatest infrastructure already established on Earth is light. Every light is wired. Every light has a cable. Every rural village where there is a light, there is a wire. And that wire is connected to another wire. And maybe that's connected to a solar panel, but most likely it's connected to some kind of a network of wires. There are 14 billion, I mean this is an amazing number, there are 14 billion lights, public street lights in the world. And every single street light can turn into an internet communication hub. That's the future. That is a real future. But the beauty of it is, who's the owner of the street light? The local governments are, usually. They think it's a cost, but the population thinks that street lights are important. It gives a sense of safety, it gives a sense of community. But now that every street light turns into an internet hub, we're turning the ownership of data around. Today, who owns your data? If you're connecting from your phone over a phone, over a service provider, that service provider owns your data. And if you're using that service provider to check Alibaba or Google, Google has the data and Alibaba has the data. And they own your data. And you have agreed every time when you use it that they can do with the data whatever they want. And I'm saying give my democracy back. Real democracy is not just voting in parliament. Real democracy is what do people do with what you provide as information. And if data mining and big data is the future, then you should have the right to co-decide with other people in your community what happens to your community data. And that's not been possible because we've been hijacked. Now community data goes back to the community because if it runs over the local light system, it is your light system, it is your data. Wow, we own our data. Yeah, and Google and Alibaba has to ask permission if they can use our data and I can say no. Today you have said yes when you log in to your email. You have told them, and that's why I think it's absolutely right that some governments say, we don't want this. We block you guys out. And they should be blocked out, because it's not fair. There are five companies in the world that control 90% of all data in the world. Five. Does it make sense? So my interest is not to fight Wi-Fi. Is not to fight the internet. My interest is to provide services for the common good. And so I'm looking for places where, where can we deploy Li-Fi to the best of our capabilities and to the greatest service of society. And of course one of those first ones that come, came to my mind is the metro. I mean, how many visually impaired persons do you see going through Hong Kong metro on their own? Have you ever seen a visually impaired person going through the metro on her own? No, because you can't. Because the system of elevators is good for physically impaired persons, but not visually impaired persons. And so the rolling staircases and the elevators and the fact that you don't have a gate going into the train means that there is a big gap. And if you're not one centimeter precise, a visually impaired person can end up on the rails instead of in the train. On top of that, you have big gaps between your train and your 
platform. So we have as a priority in February we have installed for visually impaired a guide system in the metro in Paris. I mean, who else would you want to surf? Visually impaired people have been excluded from public transport. And I think the first thing we should do is reintegrate them in society. We all agree they should be integrated in society. And integration in society, amongst others, means mobility. And mobility is key. And, and the dog and the stick can't do it in this form of mobility. And so therefore, we have decided that this is a priority. On Tuesday, I'm meeting with the president of the Visually Impaired Society of Hong Kong. I took the metro and I came to the conclusion that the metro of Hong Kong urgently needs to save energy. Because what can we do? We change all the light bulbs in every station, we save 80% energy, and with the money we save on the energy savings, we can make a guidance system for free for the visually impaired. This is how we think. This is how we act. But if you do it for the visually impaired, may I submit to you that any foreigner who comes for the first time to Hong Kong and who doesn't know Chinese is most likely a visually impaired person as well. We have no clue where to go. I mean, for you it may be automatic when you get out of the airport where to go, but it's not obvious for me. And so let's consider every visitor to Hong Kong as a visually impaired person. If you're able to guide the really visually impaired people through the metro in Hong Kong, you can guide any tourist through Hong Kong using public transportation. Wouldn't that be nice? And we can do it in 150 languages because there our friends from Google have gotten a Google Translate. Let's do that. Let's use Google Translate. They're not bad all the time. They're good as well. They're great things they've done. They're revolutions they have created. But let's get it into balance. Google Translate is an extraordinary service that can be offered. And so let's do Google Transit, Translate so that anyone who comes to Hong Kong can now be guided by light. Isn't it interesting? the blind or guided by light. This is, as you can imagine, another fable. It works. It's actually embarrassingly simple. But it would never work with a radio wave because it's too slow. And radio waves that typically don't work very well in a confined environment where there is a lot of metal. So as soon as you're in a metro, and you're on the ground, and there's a train arriving, and there are 20 people around you downloading videos, you are excluded from the network. So what we want to make certain is that every time you pass under a lamp, you're connected. You go from lamp to lamp, from light to light. There's a very famous saying in the Bible, Genesis, saying, let there be light. Well, yeah, let there be light, you know, and use it for internet. I mean, the number of applications uh, are extraordinary, and I will not go through all the details. But since you can be one centimeter precise, you can download or you can write your shopping lists onto your smartphone, and the moment you get into the parking, the Li-Fi system picks up your shopping list and will take you not to the shop, will take you to the spot where your Tabasco is. Because people, when they want Tabasco, they hardly ever find it in the supermarket. Well, yeah, it's a tiny bottle, so, you know, I mean, even the people in the shop most of the time don't know. But once you have this in the system, you have a GPS system. We don't call it GPS anymore, we call it the geolocation system in every store. And have you seen those billboards lately with the, that, that are light lit up? It used to be a billboard of paper. Now it's a big screen that's a billboard. 
when you come through, pass by this billboard, the billboard will have taken all your measures. And if your shopping says that you were looking for a sweater, it will take you to the stores that will have the sweater of your size. And when you get into the store, the sizes will be the right sizes. You don't have to look for sizes anymore. You can look for the beauty of the, of the sweater you want. Complete change around. Complete new look. You will register your shoe size and the shoes with your normal or strange shape of feet will always have the right shoes in the right store. Now, that is so much better than Alibaba and Amazon because it's in reality. It will revive the shopping centers. It can revive the shopping streets. It can bring people out again. It can create communities again around the streets where all the shops can now be communicating directly with people to give what they wanted. And the backbone is the streetlight. We have a special program to provide rural communities with street lights, with solar panels, and it creates an intranet of information for the people in that community. They don't need internet. I mean, 52% of the world does not have access to internet. Let's get them connected, not to the internet so they can watch porno. Let's connect them to their community so they can have all the key information the community needs in order to be a thriving community. I mean, let's make certain that they have that access. And if they like the music, let's get it on a local server, the music that, we, that most of the people would like, and provide that locally. Don't throw people of rural areas into the world of satellites. Internet over light has the opportunity, has the advantage that it has zero radio waves, so it doesn't affect your brain, it doesn't affect cells. If you find what you want, it means that the shops immediately have a 4% sale increase. Same day that people find what they want. You're not selling them what they don't want, you just make them find what they want. 4% increase in sales, 80% energy savings you cut energy consumption by 80%. And you're 200 times faster than 5G, which doesn't exist yet. 200 times faster. That means we can bring to rural communities the fastest internet. And they control their own data. This is how it looks like. That lamp is connected to the computer through the light. It's a home system. It was launched in Las Vegas, of all places. It was launched in Las Vegas two weeks ago. We went to Las Vegas to kind of poke our American friends who think that Li-Fi has no future. Of course, if I were one of the big uh, suppliers of um, routers for the internet, I would not like this because one router is 360 watt lamps working 24 hours a day. We eliminate that. Are we okay? Are we fine? Yes? You know, every orange peel is a dishwashing liquid in a toilet cleaner. You know, sometimes I'm coming across these innovations and they're embarrassingly simple. I mean, it's embarrassing. We would expect something more sophisticated behind it. And unfortunately, science today is, is always looking for more complex and more sophisticated things. But sometimes, you know, we would be so happy with something very simple. This is the factory that I built in 1991. This was the first zero emissions, zero waste factory. And I had a hundred staff. But you see the parking space? This was not Sunday. I paid my workers to come on a bicycle. I paid them half a dollar a mile to ride a bicycle to work. And you know what happens when people get paid half a dollar a mile to ride a bicycle to work? They ride the bicycle to work. It's a very simple thing. But 
People said, oh, this must be very expensive, 100 people riding the bicycle at that price. No, because instead of having 100 parking spots, I only had seven. And 93 parking spots saved, divided over all staff with the distance that they were riding, meant that for the next five years I could pay them half a dollar a mile. This was, this was not expensive. This was paying back to the people for being healthy. Because in the end of the day, someone who rides the bicycle every day is much more healthy than the one who sits in a car every day. And this is the kind of logic that we needed. I was very keen to do that because my greatest frustration in life is that I was the producer of detergents. And my detergents were made from palm oil. And in 1993, in November, when I was in Indonesia and I realized I was destroying the rainforests, I realized I had biodegradable products that were not sustainable. So biodegradability has nothing to see with sustainability. I needed to have a sustainable product. And that's when I started getting excited about citrus fruits, where with one kilo of peels, one liter of water and seven spoons of sugar, and fermentation, of course, we have a wonderful vinegar that is an extraordinary kitchen cleaner and a fantastic uh, toilet cleaner. And you can even adapt it in order to wash your clothes in it. They will smell fresh. Of course, I wrote a fable about it. The largest initiative we've taken in Europe, the largest initiative that I've been involved, is really to make thistles into a useful product. I don't know if you have this flower in Hong Kong, but it's a weed. In Europe, it's the worst weed. It's the, the reason why we need Roundup and glyphosates to kill the weed. Now, we don't succeed in killing because we've been applying glyphosates for 40 years and the weed comes back all the time. So something in the glyphosate is not working. Now, if you're in the glyphosate's business, in the Roundup business, this is great business because you can sell every year again. We turn the biomass into polymers to make plastics. We turn it into capsules for coffee. We turn it into elastomers for surgery gloves. We turn it into lubricants. And we can turn it into herbicides. After 40 years of Roundup, we have nature's revenge. And nature's revenge means that the weeds that were supposed to be killed by Roundup now produce the substitute to the Roundup from the weeds. And then there was this lady coming to visit and wondered if we had a bit of the white dust of the flowers available. And we had no idea why we should collect the white dust on the flowers until she explained that that's a bacterial enzyme which helps make goat cheese, the tradition of Sardinia. And so we made a calculation and we came to the astonishing conclusion that probably we could produce a thousand tons of these uh, these bacterial enzymes. That means we could supply whole of Italy with enzymes for making goat cheese. An amazing insight that goat cheese could be made with the bacterial enzymes from the flowers that we are turning into herbicides, elastomers, polymers and lubricants. You know, the opportunity to see those things and to see them come to fruition and to implement gives you a lot of joy in life. I mean, it makes you a happy person. And it makes you energetic enough so that when all the obstacles come, you feel like you can surf around them. You don't have to fight the obstacles. Because we're not creating the waves, we're surfing waves and we're going around where the obstacles are. Surfers, they look where the energy is. Surfers don't make the energy. So I'm a surfer. I'm creating nothing. I'm surfing where energy is flowing. 
And, and, and this is why the fables for me are my lifeline, my legacy. If we as individuals don't commit to take the time to tell the stories to the children, then we're not preparing life for eternity. Then we're just surviving. To me, the most important task of any parent is not putting your kids to school. The most important task for every parent is to tell every day a wonderful story to the children. And if you don't have children, there are a lot of kids who don't have parents reading stories to them, so make use of the opportunity. To me, this is the key. The key is telling stories, inspiring stories. Or as I said in the beginning, it's not about and then they marry, have children and live happily ever since. No. At the end of every story we say, and it only has just begun. And then the child feels responsibility, feels opportunity, feels the chance to do much better than the parents do. And the child will never understand how dumb dad is actually is. I mean, when a child le le learns about the story of the apple in the tree, how did the apple get up in the tree? You know, do, do you know how the apple gets up in the tree? I mean, I'm sure you know the law of gravity, how it comes down. But you know, there's something very practical. Before the apple comes down with the law of gravity, the apple had to get up. And no university, no middle school, no elementary school, no school in the world teaches how the apple got up. Defying the law of gravity, making use of seven laws of physics. Amazing! How come we miss that? How come we are claiming to be so smart, to be so sophisticated, and we can't even explain how an apple gets up? Or we can't explain how the water gets into the coconuts? We have no idea how the water got up. It gets up. Yeah, how? Is there a pump somewhere? No, there's no pump. So how did it do it? And I think this is what we need. We need to inspire the children to the point that they realize our parents, they don't know so much about life. They don't know the basics of being happy and healthy. And when a child realizes that and the parents admit it, then the child will pick up its responsibility and commit to its community to do better than their parents could ever imagine. And then we have a future, a grand future. Thank you. <laughs>